and welcome to a special edition of Two Up Top with myself, Gav Mack, and the former professional footballer and ex Leighton Orient manager, John Sitton. John, hello and thank you for joining me on the show today. Uh, good afternoon. All right, mate. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you very I've much. Got, I've, got, I've got a lot on my plate. I've got a lot on my plate, but, you know, um, always uh, happy to break off and chat a bit of football. Oh, happy days. What have you been up to today, then? Um, same as what I've been up to since my last... I think my last day's work was something like March the 20th. And I've followed the thing with a lockdown. I've done as I was told. I've complied. And um, my missus more than me, you know, in terms of positivity... I've tried to utilise the time as best possible, uh, best way possible. So we started off, we've been doing um, a lot of gardening, mm. uh, trying to get the, the house up straight. We're having a block in the middle of redecorating. So just used it as a, an opportunity to give everything a little bit of a, you know, an uplift. Um, Is that your choice or her know, choice? No, I don't mind it. I love a bit of gardening. <laughs> gardening, I've always seen it. I've, said, I've, I've always said to me, my missus just shakes her head at me, you know what I mean, in bewilderment. I've, said, I've always seen gardening as uh, uh, similar to coaching, but with a bit bit more of an escape, you know what I mean? So you can plan things how you want. You get stuck in, you work hard. If something, you know, you, you try and encourage stuff to grow, and if it don't grow how you like, you snip it and get rid of it. <laughs> so it's a bit like coaching. <laughs> it sounds just like coaching, to be fair. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I, I'm, once again, I'm, I'm glad to have you on the show and I really want to know more about the real John Sitton. So um, to, to start off with, you know, I want to know from the early days, from, from your childhood, whereabouts did you grow up? Um, well, I grew up in North London, but, but after being born in the East End, I, I was actually uh, was born in the Salvation Army Mother's Hospital in... Um, of, was it 153 Lower Clapton Road, I think the address. Mm. Uh, it's like Yuppies have got hold of it now. It's like an apartment block, but it was a mag- magnificent building and uh, staffed by nuns. Oh, OK. Um, so, yeah, I was born there. Um, like we've just been discussing before you've done the thing, you know, like uh, October the 21st, which is like really should be a national holiday, not because I was born that day, but... Uh, just my to daughter will be born the, that day uh, as well. I think it should be a keep, national holiday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it, keep it back, keeping the French back, and uh, the anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. So, uh, yeah, I was born, uh, born over there, but then um, I spent most of my life in North London. Mm. Um, it just, just down the road. I was actually the the name for it was uh, it was actually called the Boundary. So I was round about there. It was called the Boundary, and it was literally the line between Edmonton and Tottenham. Oh, okay. So just out, just down the road from the Spurs ground. Yeah, yeah. So were you were you red or white when you grew growing when you were growing up? Uh, my dad brought me up as an Arsenal supporter. Um, I knew there's a reason why I liked yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, like he, he, I remember just like we was watching the game on the telly. It was, um, it must have been the first match of the season. But we always used to take our annual holidays last week of July, first week of August, mm. and uh, all my family were basically self-employed and whatnot. And then, um, uh, you know, so it's just like like land and properties, shops and stalls, and different bits and pieces. And then um, we used to go to an holiday camp in uh, Clacton. So uh, sometimes in the evening, if we weren't on the on the Clacton Pier watching a show, we, we'd also have my mum and my dad and my aunt to take us to the to the uh, the fun fair at Walking on Nays. Then across the road at the end of the fair, which used to close about ten o'clock, um, that we used to go to. It was like a family room in a pub, really tiny pub. And then uh, I remember seeing like a grainy black and white. Um, show on TV and it was match of the day. Oh, right, on about okay. five, six. Yeah, and it was like, um, I distinctly remember, I'm pretty sure it was Don Howe at right back getting absolutely shredded by Peter Thompson. <laughs> um, anyway, I said to my dad, look at that. I said, Dad, can we go football? He said, he said, yeah, he said, I'll take you to football, son, no problem. He said, uh, "Get you've got to get a little bit bigger first. He said, and then I'll take you. He said, but on one condition. I went, what's that? He said, we only go to the Arsenal. Because what it was, my dad was born in uh, and brought up in Kentish Town. Oh, right, okay. Present. Yeah. Very yeah. Arsenal land. Yeah. So, every, every Arsenal home game on, mm. the, on the North Bank. And then, um, you know, things happen along the way. And me being me, uh, which is, I'm loyal, but not particularly tribal. Yeah. Um, as you start to move into professional circles, you, all you're interested in is the team you play for. Yeah. And then, and then, obviously, like wherever you've been, normally what happens is like you 
you know, your experiences dictate your memories, if you understand what I'm trying to say. You mm-hmm. know, they they uh, they sort of dictate your your thoughts on like, yeah, that was good. That the first couple of years there was good. That was an unbelievable couple of years. That was good. Da, 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 da. I didn't like that so much. I didn't like playing for him. And but you know, inevitably, the, the, like the common denominator is, is you, you, your mind tends to revolve around the club you, you that you that you're playing at and that you signed for. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember. I remember conflict of interest at Millwall with a couple of lads because. Uh, you probably couldn't get any worse. You had uh, Paul Roberts, who captained the FA Youth Cup winning side, come through the ranks, and Davey Martin, who was my roommate. They were like fanatical West Ham supporters. So you couldn't have had a more volatile mix of like West Ham supporters <laughs> West playing, like Millwall. playing the Millwall. You know oh, I mean? Jesus. Yeah. So I, well, I remember saying to Rob, I like, you know, I don't want to be putting a foot wrong if I was you, you know, because you know for sure... Um, it, it, it was going to get thrown back up in their face, but so I just used to keep my cards a little bit closer to my chest. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've been like really sort of non-committal. Although yeah. I, what I will say is I like all, all I like all London teams to do well. Obviously, mm-hmm. when it comes to the Premier League, I want I, ideally I want a London team to do well. Yeah, um, but I'm not that tribal, you know. What I mean, if it's Europe, I want all British clubs to do well. Right? Yeah. As in, like England, Scotland, North, whoever's in it, I want them to do well. And but then the national side, um, it's England. But then if England haven't qualified, which you know you're younger than me, during my lifetime, there's been a lot of times where we ain't qualified. See, I'm I could only think the of 08 and, two, uh, 08 oh, and 1994 on. when England didn't qualify. Other than that, you know, England yeah, yeah, never yeah. present sort of thing for me. So I know what you mean on that one. I, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty similar to you when it comes to um, supporting British clubs in, in club competitions. So like the Champions League, Europa League, etc. And I want all the British teams to do well yeah. until the knockout stages. But when it gets to knockout stage, like I had a right panic last year in the Champions League final, thinking that Spurs might win the Champions League before Arsenal. And I don't think I'll be able to yeah. live with myself if no, that yeah. happened. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when you look at the way they started, though, with a thing, I just thought, what are you doing? This is where, this is where you know, sort of part of the thing where as a player part, you've got to be switched on right from the off. Yeah. I mean, the, the penalty, you know, the, the, within seconds, you know, I mean, it probably set a game. precedent for the rest of the game. Mm. You know what I mean? But, yeah. Definitely. So you would say then, like, your affiliation with football sort of began when you were sort of five or six. Were you, were you playing football in the streets and that as well? Or were you just going, to, going down yeah, to yeah. Arsenal? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I always had a, you know, like at, at that age, really, it was like uh, more organic. I mean, mm. you know, I always had a ball. Uh, my dad always made sure I had, had, had a ball when I would just should take it out in the yard and have a kick about or have a kick about over the park. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, we had a local group there, you know, it was all quite friendly and it was everyone was quite close. It was a community. And um, yeah, truth be told, we was always disappearing over the park. You'd have a little, little bit of time doing other stuff on the swings or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mainly it was always mainly f- football, 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 and yeah. then um, you know inevitably as you mature and and then you start getting in, you make inroads into representative honours at school, and then we had a youth club going. So the the week was pretty much taken up with uh, nothing but football. Um, yeah. Although I was doing initially, I was doing well academically. I was I was doing okay. Oh, okay. you know, was, uh, I've I've always tried. I mean, this is this is a little bit. Um, I don't know, a bit self con- congratulations or a little bit sort of. I don't know if it's narcissistic or what. I've always, I've tried a fine line all my life between being sort of a little bit rough and ready and a little bit sort of street and urban. For, you know, for want of a better phrase, it's like you know postmodernistic bullshit. But I've, uh, you know, I've always tried tried a fine line between that and a- academia. You yeah. know what I mean? I've I've always been I've always been good with the reading and the books and the studying, but then when when football came along, I just couldn't get, keep my mind off it. Mm. You know, it was it was the only thing I didn't want my mind on anything else. So, but I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know who listens and who who watches, but if I could give any advice, I'd just say, don't matter how hard it feels at the time, and how difficult it feels at the time. If I could have my time again, I would do both. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I, I, I could, any young player, I couldn't stress that I couldn't stress that highly enough. And, and and maybe, you know, as many interests outside, positive influences and as many interests outside the game as you can possibly manage, you know what I mean? No, but, that's brilliant. Um, I, I want a national, I want, I want a natural athlete. So, 
if if the truth be told, I was always cream cracker. Do you know what I mean? So I trained my heart out, and then used to come home and fall a kip. <laughs> yeah. You um. So that's a that's a different. Yeah. Your your um your youth on, career uh, began at Arsenal, I believe. And yeah, you yeah, moved on to Chelsea. Yeah. So um, how old were you yeah. when you when you first signed for like for the Arsenal academy, so to speak? Yeah, no, what it was back then, you used to be invited in for, um, like, evening coaching. Oh, right, okay. And then yeah. there, was, there was a few, pork, yeah, there, there was a few pork pies told, uh, a few porky pies. There was, um, I was training with 14-year-olds. I was only 12. Mm. And my, they, they said about, oh, about my age and all that, because I was quite big for my age. And then there was, um, there, was a, there was a kids' program once upon a time called Twizzle. Um, <laughs> it, it was like, I was like, I was like, you know, not particularly tall, I was about three foot, uh, between three and four foot. Then all of a sudden, I was going up like, you know, a foot a year, whatever. You know what I mean? And by the time by the time I was 12, I was probably um, knocking on the door of between um, five and six foot. And then a couple of years later, I was six, I was six feet tall. You know what I mean? Just wow. a tad over six feet tall. My old man said, go and get in there, it'll do you good. So I, I started off there. I was playing against kids a couple of years older. And they had... Um, it was like evening coaching sessions. And then what they would do, they would cherry pick um, what they thought were the best kids mm-hmm. uh, to sign schoolboy forms, gotcha. uh, which is how it worked back then. Then you were basically affiliated to that club. They had a hold over you for two years, unless you could get them to release you and, uh, from the schoolboy form. That would take you up to 16, by which time you would know whether you were going to sign apprentice or not. Well, after a year at Arsenal, I uh, I got a very um, so it's ten months to be pedantic, right? Mm. I've got a very uh, it's a very debilitating injury. It's uh, Osgood Schlatter, which is like it happens to any adult, but it, it's enhanced when you're involved in sport, right? Because like whereas you might be walking to college every day or school or sick form, you might not notice it so much. But when you're involved in sport, what happens is it's like it, a tremendous amount of pain. And it's to do with growth spurts in, ad- right. in adolescence. Not, mm. not, 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 ju- not just make, not just a footballer, but any adolescent. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you don't come to realise these things until like many, many years later. I was delivering modules on behalf of the uh, the FA mm-hmm. uh, via the LFA for staffing coaching courses. They were doing all stuff, you know, uh, diet and nutrition, um, uh, like growth spurts in young players, uh, physiology and anatomy, blah, blah, blah. All these all these headings that you had to like brush up on and then do brainstorming sessions. And then if people didn't, uh, hadn't studied or didn't quite come up with it, you had to implement the knowledge, you know what I mean? Impart your knowledge. Mm. And I didn't come, come to realize until years later that it was all all to do with that. Um, so I had a bit of a layoff and then I started to get representative on us. And then, um, having, having got a letter saying, thanks, but no thanks, not up to the required standard. Mm. They, I said, we want you back. We want you to sign schoolboy. Well, I said uh, rather churlishly um, to me, Dad, you know, F them. They've had their chance. I'm, I'm happy at Chelsea. Yeah. Um, but Arsenal and Chelsea were two of nine clubs that I remember to this day that wanted me signature as a schoolboy. And then the, the, when I signed for Chelsea, the other clubs, they actually kept tabs on me with a view to leaving Chelsea and going to sign apprentice for them. Oh, really? Were they all clubs within the M25 corridor? Because I noticed that your your whole football career pretty much was, was based in in, a, in and around the, the M25 corridor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, part of it I regret, part of it I don't. I mean, Aston Villa were that's a little bit arrogant. I could have gone to Aston Villa. Mm. Um, uh, representatives from Man United were sent down to the Middlesex games. Mm-hmm. Spoke to me, Dad invited me up uh, to the game and uh, look look over the place and sign schoolboy forms. Uh, so I'd have been a kid when you had people like, like Jim Alton, Scott, I think Scottish International Week. People like him would have been sent back and then later on in the type of people. Um I was invited up to, to there. All I got from Aston Villa was an invitation to sign Apprentice and they sent me uh, a massive envelope with with a pamphlet in it and a booklet and all these pictures of and and and, and basically stuff written about where I would stay and we've got mm. this hostel attached to the club. This is where the young players, you know, have their, have their bed and bed and breakfast or bed and board and then you'll be expected to do etc um 
Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, I didn't quite fancy that. I did, I, I'm a bit of a homeboy, a bit of a mummy's boy. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was, I was, I, I'm not. I'm not embarrassed. I don't think there's any that. shame I, in that I, I, at all. Mum. No, not at all. I'm exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. I was very close to me, mum, and um, I thought to myself, well, would I want to be up north for Aston Villa or Man United? And then I look at the other ones. There was uh, Fulham, and the guy who was at Fulham wanted me to sign. He actually left and went to Crystal Palace. So then it became Crystal Palace wanted to sign me on, on their recommendation. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember towards the end of a season, um, the man himself turned up, Malcolm Allison, who I think is unofficially the godfather of of, uh, of coaching in this country. Mm. Um, 25, 30 years ahead of his time, radical, innovative, outspoken, flamboyant. And he walked straight up to me. Dad was talking to the Chelsea scout. And he, he said, oh, you know, there are good reports about your boy. He had his chief scout with him, Arnie Warren. And they bowled up in a Mercedes, jumped <laughs> come as I was warming up. And then started talking numbers, you know what I mean, in brown envelopes. Mm. And so, so you had uh, Villa, United, Fulham, um, Crystal Palace, Chelsea I was already at. Arsenal would ask me to go back, Colchester. Um, and then I went and had a, a session or two at QBR. Mm. And I didn't quite like the vibe there. Um, I don't know, Colchester did. I don't know if I mentioned them. And uh, he was manager there. Um, he came over and watched me, uh, what, the guy who... Uh, they called him the Bald Eagle. What's the, who's the case that they called the Bald Eagle? Uh, anyway, he came over and he watched and he said, I, I thought, so when I had a look around now, I thought, nah, that ain't for me. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I was quite, I was quite, I, I wasn't really, my, my dad was going on about the numbers that were being thrown around at Crystal Palace and I just said, I might be where I am. I yeah. said, I'll be honest, dad, tell him, obviously I'm very flattered. Yeah. He said, I've got a, yeah, he said, we'll help your boy. He said, I've got a young up, me, up, up and coming coach helping me. He said, we're trying to get all the best kids in the country, particularly around the London area. This is Malcolm Allison. Mm-hmm. He said, like, and um, we want to mould them and, and, and coach them. And he said, you know, by the time they're 20, most of them will be in the first team. And mm-hmm. it, it was it was an unbelievable group. Unbelievable. Like Vince Lea, who I used to come up against on the Sunday mm-hmm. um, and, and and the county. So you had Vin, Vince Lea, you had people like Jerry Murphy. Who'd all, he'd been at Chelsea with me and left to go to Palace. Billy Gilbert. Um, you had a, it, it, it was, uh, who else was there? Peter Nicholas, uh, Stevie Lovell. Um, yeah, well, I mean, they're, they're, some, some reputable names in, in Chelsea folklore <laughs> that you're, yeah. that you're spouting there. So it wasn't exactly a, yeah. a bad team that you played in. Um, would you, were you always a defender? Where, where was, where did you want to play and was defence something that you had, an idea of playing in in the future. Um, I read somewhere. I'm not sure it's true. <laughs> it tickled me. It said the definition of a of a decent centre half is a fouled centre forward. <laughs> so in answer to your question, so in answer to your question, um, yeah, no, I, I I did dabble. I did dabble with other positions, and I probably started out like all kids wanting a bit of wanting the glory. Yeah, you know, and it was like um, almost sort of polar opposites. You know, um, I spoke to, uh, I mean, when I was at Millwall, he was only a kid coming up through the ranks. I spoke to him recently, Neil Ruddock, and he's, he's he, I actually used used one of his quotes in my book. He said, like you, you got to be a bit of a silly bollocks to play centre back because there's there's no glory there. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, I think like a lot of all kids, you, you know, now they're all like the. They want to play the. It was no different back then, you know. I suppose you wanted to go with the with the flow of, um, you know, getting a little bit of recognition. So, mm. um, I played up front. I played up front um, quite a few times at uh, for schools and youth clubs and district. I was even stuck up front once um, in the FA Youth Cup against Crystal Palace. Mm. All the names I just rattled off, they all came through the ranks at Palace. Oh, gotcha. And I remember drawing them in the FA Youth Cup when we was at Chelsea. So. Uh, uh, I was put up there to disrupt things. Yeah, I've got to be honest that 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 question, what you've what you've uh, you've just asked, even way back then, what happened was you start if you've sort of engaged. Let's say, yeah, let's say that's the best word. You've engaged as a young player with football and with the football surroundings. If you're in a good place and and and. Contrary to popular uh, popular belief and contrary to myth, 
Chelsea was in the top one, two, three of places to be at in terms of the coaching environment, the players, and giving youth a chance. And like, so, so, like youth development, this, uh, it was the right, 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 yeah, yeah, I, 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 I've, I've remarked in my book all this about West Ham and they, they never produced anyone for 25 years. I don't even know where that come from. <laughs> Arsenal always had a solid, slowly but surely. Uh, now, when you see like uh, people like Pardew and with their muggy T-shirt, the Real Academy and all that cobblers on, you know what I mean? What you got to do, you got to do your own work and you got to look at you just got to be truly honest. And it it used to spank them six people for 20 minutes. Obviously, you play them spank them six ball for 20 minutes yeah so who, who, who did they turn out you know what I mean I didn't start turning out I didn't start turning out players until uh, uh, latter day where you had the Ferdinand brothers and you had likes and, like Lampard and Lampard and Coles you know yeah. I mean? but in my era my era no, no way no way um, <laughs> before my era massively you know what I mean so you, you had like you, you had people um um like the, like the stories go, going going to Palici's calf and playing with the salt and pepper pots, and you know you got Bobby Moore speaking like I did, very highly of Malcolm Allison, and and saying what a great mentor he was, you know. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of big names started there, and it's like anything in football, it's like um, cyclical, you know, or, or peaks and troughs, you know. It's either it's either cyclical and 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 it comes around again, and they they have a thing where a good period where they produce great young players. It just so happened where when it was my turn, they, a lot of them were being produced at places like Crystal Palace and Chelsea. Like he's, I was going to say to you, I went off at a tangent. He's saying I've got a a good a good a young coach, up and coming coach who's going to help me, and it was Terry Venables. Oh wow! So yeah, Malcolm Allison and Terry Venables and John Cartwright, mm. uh, three of the most uh, innovative minds in coaching, all working at one club. Wow! And well, they when did you, say, when didn't I look they? Back, I just think, you know. they, they did say because there was, there was a, a documentary on um, not too long ago on um, on BT Sport about the team that was that was meant to be the next big thing, and it was it was Crystal Palace because Crystal Palace they're, yeah. they're, of their youth setup, of their of the management style, the players that were there, they, they were meant to be yeah. the next big thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that the, 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 like the young Eagles were going to be the team of whatever decade it was. I think it's the eighties, wasn't it? Mm. The eighties. Yeah, so so the work had started. The point I'm making, uh, tiny what you said, the work had started in seventy five, seventy six, mm. which is when we was all coming up to sign apprentice. And um that scene of him pulling it at the car park in a Merc, big Mal, with Arnie Warren driving it, I'll never forget it. I was playing middle for Middlesex versus Berkshire. Yeah. Um and that, that was the end of that season, seventy five, seventy six. And that summer, we was all all uh, ready. The summer of seventy six was when we all signed Apprentice. Mm. So, but I'd already made I'd already made my commitment, and um, yeah, I mean at the time, it was a pretty good atmosphere at Chelsea, and things were sort of gathering a bit of momentum, and it was like a feel good factor, um, down to one or two individuals around the club, like Eddie McCready, who was coming up to be manager. Mm. Um, and 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 a uh, you know a, like a well respected, well recognised ex player Eddie Mack, um, and people like Ken Shilato and Dario Grady who ultimately left the club. Mm. When I first went there, Dave Sexton, Dave Sexton was still in charge. Um, so there was like a it was a good coaching environment and yeah. a bit of a feel good factor, you know. Um, what are you saying about playing centre forward? This is when you think start seeds start to get sown in your head. And even way back then, and I might not have shown it when I became a little bit volatile and a little bit too outspoken and a little bit uh, rebellious when, when Brian Eastick turned up from QPR. Um, you know, there, there's, there, there's uh, I, I started to have an empathy with coaching uh, or coaches, you know what I mean? So trying to look, look at things from their point of view. And, you know, it was like um, sort of congratulating them really in my own mind how it is that I was, because I happen to believe this is when the first seeds were uh, sown in my head with regards to coaching. <clears throat> and I happen to believe that the environment was such at Chelsea, whereby the co the players were so well coached, um, there were quite a few players who could play in almost any position on the football field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I think that's like, that's like, um, 
yeah, almost like a tribute to, to how well coached they've been, if you understand what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. So when I was asked later on in my career, having been taught it and having come through it, good, bad or indifferent or average, and I like to think that I was always a seven or eight out of ten. Yeah. And I had one game, a couple of games at left back at Gillen and where I soaked because I thought it got to the stage where, um, you know, basically um, – Keith Peacock, who I, who, who I booked as a, you know, a dub, he played a lot of games, but he's just basically an average winger for Cholton <laughs> and, uh, and a bit of pseudo-intellectual. And sometimes, and I've been guilty, you could, you could be too clever for your own good. Well, what happened was he started to take liberties with my career and he took the piss, so I had a sulk. Mm. But sticking to the original point, I could play in any position in the back four. I had games in midfield with Gillian where I was outstanding. Mm. Um, and then, like I said, I'd, I'd had a few games up front um, where they put the cat amongst the pigeons, you know, when I was at Chelsea. Just go mix it up I a little think bit. If a player is, is, yeah, exactly, rough, rough them up. But, it, you know, there was a little bit more to my game than that. So but, but, but people make the massive mistake of uh, judging me by my sort of, let's say, pugnacious looks and gregarious nature. Um, <laughs> but you know, I've, never, I've, never ever had, I've never ever had the credit that I should have had for some of the things that I've done in certain football matches, you understand? Yeah, I get that but completely. The, the original point being, if you're coached well enough, Right, and I've always said it, and I've always maintained it. And I first recognised it at Chelsea. If you're coached well enough, and even at international level in this country, you've only got to look at the 2018 World Cup, yeah, where you've got certain members of England staff who don't even know what they're looking at because mm-hmm. we got fucking shredded by Croatia for 20 minutes, right? And someone should have said to Southgate, if Southgate didn't see it himself, someone should have said to Southgate, uh, and that's someone who's using uh, set pieces from circa. Uh, 87 to 93 yeah. um, and, and receiving plaudits for stuff that was thought of 25 years, 20 years ago, right? Let's say, uh, well, it is nearly 25 years ago, right? Yeah. 20 or, <laughs> well, or even longer, else, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> someone should have said, well, we've got to adjust the formation, yeah? And we've got to change this. You've got to push him in here. You've got to tell him to drop off and to do. We need someone else up front. Harry's coming too deep to receive the ball. They've got to be engaged to stop them getting forward because they're leaving two v one against Harry and the, the the fullbacks are pushing on. So they've got a massive overload in midfield. If you look at a twenty minute period in that game, right? No one said it, and our midfield players were doing doggies, mm. and we had five at the back marking one. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So none of that was done. So tying it in with the original point being, if you're well coached enough, right, you should be able to play in any position on the football field, right? Ish. Preach. You understand? No, I, no, I, 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 I wholeheartedly I agree with that. Yeah. Right. And, and, and just as importantly, like that, right, you should be, you bump from the touchline, you should be able to slip into any system, any system you can think of. Yeah. Starting with a basic one that is now deemed Muppetry, right? Uh, 442. Four, four, and then anything you care to name, right? It, it's, I mean, for me, it's, it's Muppetry. It's double basic and it's very, 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 very easy to coach and you can get from A, A, A to B or A to C very quickly if you're going through the three thirds, A, B, C, you know, so you've got the back third, the middle third, right? And it's very, very easy to coach in terms of passing and movement, right? Mm-hmm. But any any other formation you can think of, 5 three, two, three, five, two, my favourite, 5 diamond one, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is the one that England should play, three, four, three, four, three, three. Um, and when I look at it, um, it's almost as if it's like um, I went and saw Chelsea West Ham on my 60th birthday as a guest at Stamford Bridge. West Ham won one nil, mm-hmm. and Chelsea played three three four three. And all they kept doing was literally, if I'm going like this, I, I could bang my head against this wall, knowing that I'm not going to get anywhere. Right? Uh, they played three four three and had one pattern of play for the whole game. Yeah. Right. Well, my 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 um, sort of uh, theory or mantra or or um, what you might call uh, coaching acumen would say would suggest that I feel if a player is well coached enough, he can play in any position. Within that position, he should be able to slot into any system. Mm-hmm. That I've just like I've just named four three 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 four. Any any formation you want to come out with four diamond two. Any of these weird and wonderful concoctions, right? And they should be able to slip into any system. And then not only that, the way I was going with things at, at Late Orient, right? You should be able to change your patterns and you should be able to change your system, uh, I think, three or four times, five times mid 
mid-street, mid-game. Yeah, I agree you with understand? that because, like, you know, like when you, like, you're talking about all these different um, different patterns and different formations and things like that. If you are playing four four two, I mean, like, I'm an Arsenal fan, and my when I was growing up, four four two was was our formation, and we had a solid yeah. back four a decent combative midfield and two decent strikers at the yeah. top. But as we were progressing, we started playing a 4-4-1-1, four, four, one, one, which isn't too much of a difference between 4-4-2 four, two, uh, four, four, two and maybe like a 4-5-1 because your, your, your guy who's in behind can come into the midfield. Your, your wingers can then push forward to make it a 4-2-3-1. You know, when they're defending, they could come back and make it a 4-5-1 flat. So... I think you're right on what you're saying there. Um, you should be able to be able to adapt mid-game. If you're if you're playing a certain position, you shouldn't just be like, "Well, I'm a centre yeah. midfielder. I only play centre midfield." Well, do you play centre midfield in yeah. a three? Do I play centre midfield in a four? Or do I play centre midfield in a five? Yeah. You know. So no, I, 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 I'm I'm yeah, I bang on the money with that. I, th- I think for sure, and you're right. But for me, I think the only difference would have been is if Harry Kane squared it. To Sterling, like a couple of years ago, we would have been in the World Cup. Final. Honest, yeah. I think France would have yeah, pumped what, us. Mind, the what, but... if, the what ifs in football, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, listen, I'm looking at it, I'm just thinking to myself, from a off, this is a bit pot and kettle, really. After my <laughs> misdemeanors at Chelsea, um, yeah, I, I you know, sort of what, what was perceived as quite a lot of stress at a young age, so. Um, leapfrog certain teams and then became mm. maybe uh, part help form part of the spot in you know southeast counties div one having leapfrog div southeast counties div two as it was then and then um, very quickly make progress uh, to be offered a professional contract and then you know what was at the time for the football combination which mm. was a tough reserve league um and then ultimately, because of circumstances, I I still maintain that, yeah, um, I might ultimately long term I might not have been good enough. I happen to think that I, I would have been, uh, because I know for sure that a 22, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 year old when you reach, you start to reach your peak um, version of me was a lot different from the 18, 19 year old mm. version of me that was thrown under the bus uh, due to circumstances and. Uh, uh, to be perfectly frank, cheats. You know, the club became full of lot like, full of cheats and people who were able to keep their head below the parapet and and hide. Mm. Um, so it wasn't an ideal environment either way uh, for for me to be uh, blooded in the side. Um, but when when I started to mature a little bit more, uh, and that's when I started to think to myself, yeah, you know, playing games with the game, uh, which was something that Brian Eastick made me aware of. You know probably one of the best jobs in football is, is youth football because what you can do and you tie it in with educating players, you can actually play games with the game. Mm. Now, while you're playing games with the game, as long as you're giving the right information to young players, um, there's no reason whatsoever why you can't accomplish what I've said, which is them being able to play in any position with any for, within any formation. Yeah. And what you said, one of the keys, right, it's a very key word that ties in with another key word that I... I, I, I think probably reflects the reasons why we haven't achieved is, and I've been guilty of it, is humility. The humility to listen and be coached. Mm. Um, knowing that the coaches, if they if they are decent, they know what they're looking at and they've got your best interests at heart. But what you said about adapt, adapting, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's a key thing in modern day football, being able to adapt. And what you want, those are the type of players you want around you, who, yeah. who, who are mentally astute enough, agile enough, to just say, right, just do this, do this, boom, boom pushing now, that are getting to drop in, et cetera, and just tink- tinker with a formation. Um, because if you're really good, if you're really good, if the player's really good and the coach is really good, let's say a Guardiola, right, yeah. at Barcelona. He got to the state where he could actually, during the COVID, and, and I'm, I'm going to be candid and frank about it, right, um, he got to the state where he could take the piss. Yeah. You understand? <laughs> yeah. So he, he could he could have they could have like a, they could do a formation where you can say what we're going to do we're going to go for the jugular or not as the case may be right we're going to dampen the game quieten the game we're going to get a stranglehold on the game and we're going to nullify the opposition right um, I don't know a derby against um, the big thing the Classico right yeah so we're going to Madrid 
we're going to shut the fans up, we're going to get them booing and waving hankies, and then we're going to go to the juggler, or vice versa. We're going to go to the juggler, we're going to down the game. And I think it gets to the stage where you could be so good as a, as a coach with such a good group of players, mm. you could say um, it's almost like driving down the motorway, put on the gas, put off the gas, put yeah, on the gas, chill. put off the gas. You understand? And you understand what I'm trying to say? No, I, mean, lines, no, I agree. And um, I, I can think of loads of examples want... where he did that as well. I mean, like, there, there was times when, he would, for instance, when he was at Barcelona, and he, he wouldn't even bother playing a striker. He would play like, Cesc Fabregas, who was definitely not a striker, but he would play him through the middle and still win the game 4-0. Because of just it, just the whole coaching dynamic, and I know when you've got players like people will argue it's like when you've got players like Xavi and Iniesta in your team, but football, yeah, massive football intelligence, massive yeah, football intelligence, exactly, yeah. and they had yeah. it in abundance. Yeah. Um, you you your playing career, you know, you, you played over three hundred career games, and you, you even popped up with a couple of goals as well. Um, but um, coaching, what what made you get into coaching? Is it seeing what well, you thought, saw then, you know, as, as you were coming through and, you know, we've had a good I old stood up, I stood up, you know what, I stood, I stood <laughs> up in my living room the other night and I just said like, um, I don't even know why I, I bothered to a degree. I was just, I was remonstrating with my missus about a comment that had been made on social media where the, I'm going to give you a long winded roundabout answer here. Yeah? That's all right. Because uh, it's my own theory, on, it's my own theory on things and it's my own theory on me. Yeah. Um, I just said to my missus, like, I'm a little bit hurt by it and all that because of what I've done uh, for certain people um, and the time and effort and the thought that I put into them to bring them up as young men and as players. And what it was, it was an interview, uh, it was a podcast, uh, Darren Purse um, and, and Glenn Wilkie. Anyway, Glenn Wilkie said that when they said about all the managers that they both played under, right back from when I, I was playing, Peter Eustace all the way through. And then Frank Clark got a mention. It was um, uh, uh, one of life's lucky boys, in my opinion, another pseudo intellectual, good, good administrator, but that's about it. Couldn't coach people. A lot of people said he was a good manager. Um, uh, probably an accomplished firefighter in terms of preserving himself mm. uh, at Leighton Orient. Uh, two successive relegations. Um, the two years before I joined and spent years firefighting. And um, basically, we had to listen to, for, for at least three years, three match chance of clock out. I don't know that a lot of me is a young one and survived. Mm. Um, at best, an average fullback when he played, etc., etc. So anyway, Darren Purse said, my dream team would be, and I think this ties in with him making a fuss of him, for, uh, him being Frank Clark, he went round with Bernie Dixon, to sign Darren Purse as a kid when he had every club in London after him. Yeah. And they guaranteed him a pro contract at 17. <laughs> anyway, long story short, Darren said his um, uh, dream team would be Frank Clark as manager and he said John Sitton as coach. And he said, John Sitton, he said, and he, play, he played at loads of places, Cardiff, Birmingham. Oh, Westbourne, yeah. I, yeah, well, I know from names. Northampton, actually. Um, Darren Purse, you know, because he well, does a lot of coaching locally. Yeah, he, 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 he had a few, nearby. Yeah, he had a few, Purse had a few million pound moves, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then he said, like, about me being in his top three, if not the top one of uh, coaches that he played under. Anyway, Wilkie, Glenn Wilkie said, uh, for me, it'd be John Sitt. And he said, like, manager, coach, whatever you want to call it. So I said to my missus, he's um, inadvertently hit the nail on the head, right? Um, trust me when I tell you it ties in with your question. Um, <laughs> and my missus my, my miss, no, no, my, my miss said, what do you mean? So I said, well, uh, coaching is management. Yeah. Because I said, I've never, I've never subscribed to or I've never understood and I've never got this... Um, bullshit about a manager and whether a manager's good or he's not good um, and, and I'll perceive as not good um, I said coaching is management mm. and when you press the rewind button on the football field as I came through as a kid then I went a bit quiet because I was the, I was the baby of the team mm. when I broke into Chelsea's first team I was like a uh, borderline gibbering nervous wreck how was I going to boss players who had just won promotion a season and a half before under Eddie McCready? And then you had like England internationals like Ray Wilkins, who, who might have bossed them. But then you realise it's 
part of the package. It's, it's, it's part of your prerequisites, what you've got to do as a, as a centre-back, right? So yeah. I grew into it. And then I was a beast at the other three clubs. I was an absolute beast with regards to bossing people and screaming at people and organising. Mm. So then a natural progression from that in answer to your question is, you're actually, while you're playing, apart from the fact that I happen to feel the more you talk, the more it helps you concentrate personally as a player, mm -hmm. um, the natural progression from being a player coach, in inverted commas, while you're playing, is to be a coach. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? So when I look at it, um, bringing it all the way up to, to present day and uh, the thing that I was a bit disappointed with about not being perceived as a uh, as maybe someone's number one choice as the, the, the manager that played under, um, although I slipped in as number two, um, my perception is that coaching actually is management. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at management in inverted commas or a manager, I've always had the, the, the theory that because uh, I go on about Harry got this and blah, blah, that, and the, the good man manager. And I've always maintained, and I still maintain to this day, once I grew up, is um, you, don't need, you don't need to uh, to be a man manager. That's my opinion. Mm. So people say to me, why? I say, why? why? Because, because men manage themselves. Yeah. You understand? I see that, what, yeah. When they, when, they talk about man man, when they talk about man management, right, um, you, you, a lot of the time with footballers, and again, it's pot kettle, you know, I mean, I've been there and uh, behaved accordingly, um, or, or in this case, appallingly. <laughs> um, you, you're, dealing with, you're, de you're dealing with a kid in a, in a young man's body. Yeah. You understand? Men mentally, you're dealing with a kid in a young man's body. So, But then when you do grow up and then like, a sense of realisation comes, boom, like this, mm -hmm. right? And you go, whoa, 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 hold on. What have I done? And I've done that so many times in my life. Oh my God, what have I done? You know, you've made a certain mistake or whatever. Um, but there comes a time in your life where you you have to take responsibility for your actions, and you and you have to become, uh, you know, what nature calls you or, or society expects of you. You actually have to become a man. So then that's where I say, well, okay, seed sown. Um, let's put it within a football context. You don't need a man manager because men manage themselves. Mm. I, don't, I don't believe in man management because men manage themselves. You understand what I mean? No, well, I'll, so I'll the get actual that. management yeah. part of it is the is, is the coaching. You know what I mean? So that's just my little um, what you might call. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's uh, whether it's am ambiguity. I'm being I'm being ambiguous. I don't know whether I'm going off at a tangent. I'm trying to be. Uh, uh, a bit abstract, but that's just my little my little take on it. You understand no, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I do. And um, and, and uh, <coughs> the coaching, excuse me, the coaching side of it, I just think was a natural progression. Mm. And 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 the same way as I'd made a lot of progress very very quickly as a player, I started to make progress very very quickly as a coach. Yeah. But it's like I don't know. Maybe it's a bit of a uh, nauseating analogy. You know, a little bit of a. Uh, it's like a sh it's like a shooting like a shooting star, and then it fizzles out, mm. and, and and it's self inflicted. It's self inflicted. Um, you um you mentioned Frank Clark, and I actually had a question from a friend earlier on. Um, who what he wanted to ask you. I just wanted to uh, get more of an understanding. My what second your relationship book. Was my like second book. Uh, he let well, he left me alone. My, in, in my second book, I'm gonna hammer him. <laughs> I'm going to ram him. I said on Danny. Oh, oh no, oh, no. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to ram him. I'm not going to get personal and all that. I'm just going to. going to be I'm honest. I'm just going to. I'm going to be honest and my take on it. Now, as a sixty, as a sixty-year-old man who I look back and I, I was completely uh, uh, used and abused and I was completely uh, exploited. My yeah. lover, my lover, the game and my plan ability, which I should have valued myself more. Mm -hmm. But because like I'd made mistakes earlier on in my career. And I formed my own insecurities. Um, it, you know, I became a poor negotiator. But for mm. me, uh, although I said on Danny Kelly, my sport in life on Talk Sport, mm. I spent two hour forty minutes rabbiting with verbal diarrhoea, and the geezer said I could have got two shows out of it. I said he was a good guy to play for. Well, the reason I said he was a good guy, guy to play for, from my own personal point of view, is because he left me alone. Yeah. But then you say to yourself, then you ask yourself this: Why did he leave? Why you did alone? he leave me alone? Well, he left yeah. me alone. Yeah. Well, why did he leave me alone? He left me alone because he could trust me. Mm. Right? And then from the minute I walked through the door, I was made captain because he realised, hold on, I've given 40 grand for Tommy Cunningham from Wimbledon. Mm. Dave Bassett pulled his pants down and smacked his ass. right? 
charged 40 grand for a player who, ne- who never ticked uh, any any boxes as a centre back that I did. Mm. You know what I mean? If you look at a set criteria between five five and seven set criteria for each position that I've made up in my head, or that mm. should be, or that is, right? Um, I'll, I'll tick I'll tick most of the boxes and the geezer. Who, who was the previous incumbent, both as captain, uh, he actually took a wage cut to end up on only three times more money than I was. You yeah. understand? So what was he on in the first place? Plus, I had to give 40 grand for him. And Frank Clark basically had, it, had his pants pulled down his ass smacked by Dave Bassett. Right? Yeah. But uh, sticking to specifics, uh, or, or sticking to me, he he, uh, he was a good guy to play for, in my opinion, because he left me alone. But then mm. you got to ask, why did he leave me alone? He left me alone because he could trust me to turn up on time. Um, I couldn't afford to be lazy. I wasn't an actual athlete. Uh, like some players I've come across, I'd go out and they could do 15 pints, uh, you know, six vodka and oranges, and get up the next day and run everybody into the ground. Mm. Unbelievable at places like Chelsea, even Millwall. Um, people had phenomenal capacity. And I knew that if I'd done that, I wouldn't be able to get my head off the pillar for three days <laughs> because I, yeah. I, I just I've got no I've got no um, I've got no capacity for alcohol, and I don't even really like the taste. I only ever used to drink to, to be social, yeah. to be one of the chaps, right? But at the end of the day, I used to have to draw a line. So then, as you grow up and you become your own man, I used to go, you know what? Fuck it, I'm not I'm not going out of them. You know, I'm not going to. I'm going to go straight home to my wife and then I'm going to go straight home to my wife and my baby. You mm. understand? So I'm not a complete social animal to live in like a, you know, a Franciscan monk. And, yeah, well, I wouldn't like, say that. It's more of it's more like say, knowing where your priorities lie, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. And, and my tolerance was none. Mm. My tolerance was zero. So, uh, you know, it helped the fact that I, I wasn't like the others, like, a, you know, a physical phenomenon or physical freak. So, um, you know, I, I knew I had to really look after myself. And then as a consequence, uh, he knew that I would come in every day. I'd be punctual. I'd train my heart out every day to the extent where I said to you, instead, instead of having the time and energy for other activities, which I would love to have um, carried on and learned a foreign language. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, 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 know, cer- I know certain phrases. Uh, I know bits of Greek because my wife's Greek Cypriot. I know bits of Spanish from school. I know sp- bits of German and French from school. Mm. And then as a cab driver, you pick up and you, you learn how to say the odd line in Arabic or, or um, uh, you know, uh, like other, other, other languages to just to thank people when uh, th- you're grateful for their custom. You understand what I mean? Yeah, definitely. But I would love to have like, uh, learned a musical instrument or uh, maybe learn fluently a foreign language. I was too cream cracked. All I wanted to do was slump on the set and fall asleep in front of the telly because I'd absolutely train my socks off every day mm. to stay on top of my game. You know what I mean? Um, and yeah, like I say, he, I said he was a good guy to play for because he, he, to the extent where he left me alone. But when I look at it in terms of him managing my career and helping my career, he um, he turned out to be um, a wrong one. He was, he was a complete wrong one. Mm. Him and Peacock... Both two of life's <clears throat> lucky boys. You got Clark, Clark, who was at best an average fullback. Um, he probably played for Forrest and Clough, named Cluffy's uh, thing because he was cheap. Yeah, um, and he got him for not he got him for not a lot of money, and he ends up with a European Cup winners medal. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's, 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 it's a lot of times, like times and times, like isn't it? Fate and bird. That, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, it, we stick him in there. He's solid. He'd do a job. Uh, that's all we need. Yeah, um, he, he wasn't going to pull any trees up, and then, like I said earlier about Peacock, um, you know, an average winger for Charlton, um, mm. you know, just sort of a bit of an arm ringing pseudo intellectual. Um, but he was very good at keeping players happy because he always put on sessions that players liked, yeah. Um, but in terms of coaching and progressing and helping anybody's game, nah, you know what I mean. But between the two of them, they kept me on the same money for eight years, yeah, you know, but who's fault that? I mean, even maybe to the extent where I should have said, you know what, like I've done latter day because of what happened in 95 with a documentary. We'll talk you know, about that, football surely. was basically saying, I mean, you know, you're not really, uh, you're not really going to uh, pull up any trees, uh, football was saying to me. So, uh, you know, cobblers to you. You could take it or leave it. Mm. Well, I should have maybe had been mentally strong enough to say, okay, I'll leave it. But it's like, 
Um, it's funny how it's all an intricately woven web, in my in my opinion, or what goes on in my mind at least. I think it's a lifestyle choice. Yeah, it's a lifestyle choice. You know what I mean? Back then, back then, I could I probably could have walked to one, and I got friends in Conroe one nearly thirty years with indoor pull out pool, stables, tennis courts, pigeon loft, and another one's got eleven acres. And mm-hmm. and they've you know so what the point I'm making is they've muddled through life and done pretty well for themselves. Yeah, of course. You understand? Or I could have gone another route. I could have gone another route and got a trade. But I just think at the time, um, it came too easy to me in, in the respect of uh, it being a lifestyle choice. Yeah. Now, you fast forward to now, I've actually remarked in my second book that I think it's the case also for a lot of managers. Because mm-hmm. have it right, if the truth be told, right, you're probably looking at a handful of clubs in any of the divisions – and I, I've got a theory, I'm going to believe that, let's say, two-thirds down the championship, anything, any any club under that, and then League 1 and League 2, I think is more than capable of slipping down into, if it's poorly run, um, and poor decisions are made, any any one of them is capable of slipping down into non-league, right? Mm. Right? But tying in with what I'm saying... I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a side issue. That's a different opinion, slightly. Yeah. But tying it in uh, uh, with what I was saying originally, if you look at um, management, per se, of certain football clubs, I've remarked that it's absolutely a thankless task mm-hmm. because they've got virtually no chance whatsoever of any glory, of winning anything, and not even promotion in their own division yeah. because it's so poorly funded or poorly run or both. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you've had clubs that have had money and they've gone in there and play, and and, and uh, there was money to spend at Lake Norwich before I got the job. Mm. It, and it was obviously wasted because the geezer got lazy. He couldn't coach. He didn't want to coach, but he used this. And he just wanted to buy a load of experienced players on extortionate uh, signing on fees with extortionate wages, pass their sell-by date with no resale value. Mm-hmm. And he just wanted to say uh, he wanted to do a cluffy. It is a ball tree is your best friend. Go out and play. Yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, in the end, it was just it, 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 all it was was anarchy. Mm. It was complete anarchy. You um, um you played so it. Backfired. Yeah, I, I see for sure. Um, you you, you played at Leighton Orient for for a number of years. You joined their management team in '94. Um, yeah. The, the, the documentary is out there. Did you know much about the film, and did you have any input in regards to? that being filmed or was it sort of like, was it brought on to you? How, how did that work? Uh, oh yes, all three. I'm not, I'm all about it. What it was. Um, I played from 85 to 91. Used to, uh, he didn't like me because I kept, pipe, I kept piping up. Of, it, it, it was, it was slightly contradictory and, and, and in my opinion, a betrayal. Um, he said to me that you're you're my uh, Mike Lyons. So I said to him, what does that mean, boss? Peter. Boss. Yeah, we had to call him boss. Yeah. Uh, and he said what it was, when I was at, when I was assistant manager at Sheffield Wednesday under Al Wilkinson, under Alwood, he says, uh, we signed Mike Lyons from Everton. He said, and he came in, he said he was a magnificent trainer. He was at the front in all the running. He said he had a lot of initiative. He had a lot of leadership. He was very vocal. He was a good organiser. And um, he said, Al would very quickly realise that he was on our side. Mm. And um, on top of which, he said he contributed in all the meetings like you do. He said, you're very vocal. I like the fact that you're very vocal in all the, all the team meetings mm. and you always try and contribute. So I said, oh, I know. well, that's nice. I said, I'm just being me. So uh, then I started to pipe up about certain things. And then he said... Um, I don't like the way you worded it. Anyway, what happened was our relationship ultimately was spoiled by two things. Um, he stripped me of the captaincy because, in inverted commas, quote, um, the leader of our pack should be the leader of the pack. And I said, well, what the fuck does that mean when it's at home? He said, well, Stevie, Car- Stevie Castle is the, the best cross-country runner and he wins all the cross-countries. And he's always the lead, he's always leading the pack. So I want it to reflect, be reflected in the football club and the team. So I'm going to make Stevie Castle the captain because he's he's the best runner. And um, 
yeah, there's a funny little there's a funny little addendum to that. We were so that's what happened. He stripped me of the captaincy and he gave it to Steve Castle. And there was a, a certain amount of sick of fancy with Castle and the fact that they played golf and they both loved golf. Right, blah, blah, yeah. Blah. So I just felt like, you know what, I'm with Mark Twain on that. Fuck it. I think it's a good walk spoiled. Um, and and, and um, I was to be penalised for it because all the jobs in football were given out over a game of golf or half a half. Oh, sorry, I just lost you there. Are you still there? I think uh, yeah. I think you might have just covered the mic slightly. There we are. Yeah. Are you all right now? <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. You said about um, Steve, um, Steve Castle, and um, and you know they, they, a lot of things were, were dealt with on the golf course. Yeah. Well, he, he ended up he ended up getting he ended up getting um, he ended up getting nicked for uh, doing a runner from a restaurant in uh, Leicester Square. Oh really? So we were wait, we were <laughs> we were waiting Good to leader. train one Friday morning. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it transpired he'd been locked up in uh, West End Central or Charing Cross Nick, whatever it was, and he hadn't been released, so he couldn't turn up for training. <laughs> and they asked me to take the captain's armband um, on the Saturday in a, a home game. What did you but say? Eustace never had the front. He never had the front to come and ask me himself because he used to talk about Northern Grit and soft, Southern Softies and blah, blah, blah. But he wasn't man enough to come and face me and ask me to take the captain. He sent Frank Clark, so I said to Frank... Um, is that right? He said, yeah. I said, I said, well, look, he said he was stripping me of the captaincy because he wanted the leader of the pack to be the leader of the pack and the best, and the, the captain should be the best cross country runner. And that's Stevie Castle. He said, yeah. I said, uh, well, in that case, I said, you know, that cop that gave Steve 10 yards start <laughs> <laughs> when, when he'd done, he done a runner the other night from the rest of the lesson. Anyway, <laughs> Give him the armband. The penny drops and we had a little chuckle, but like, uh, yeah, I basically, uh, I, 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 took, I took the armband and, you know, done Frank a favour that day. Um, yeah. But uh, we fell out because I, I piped up over club court. We had a diabolical run where we lost seven on the spin. Mm. And I was asked by a guy called Chris Raystrick, uh, what do you think's going wrong? So I said, I'll tell you what, what's going wrong. Um, it, I said, there's too many people not fit to wear the shirt. I said, there's me playing at Notts County. I said, I've nearly had my nose broke and had my eyes split. I said, uh, I've got a cut lip. I said, you've got the left back, Kevin Dickinson. He got top where someone left their footing on as he's clipped the ball forward. So he's done his instep. You've got Keith Day. Um, he's he's uh, got claret pouring out of both nostrils where someone's done him in a bugle. Um, I said, although to be fair, it is a big target. Um, <laughs> I said, like, and then we look up, I said, and their centre-backs are having a cigar um, because of Mark Cooper. Uh, not putting yourself about, you know, or at least uh, if you can't win the flick on, at least make it a poor clearance. And then you've got midfield players ducking out of headers and pulling out of tackles and not, in inverted commas, earning the right to play. You mm. know, so not being physically combative enough to push the opposition back. So I said, it's a fucking disgrace and they're not fit to wear the shirt. Yeah. So then some manager, uh, uh, you know, another like, uh, typical football, you know, storytelling, gossip mongering, scumbag Owen and who was manager of Huddersfield said oh have you heard your captain on club call and then uh, Eustace called me in the office after getting the copy of the tape sent the, the commercial manager who hadn't raised a fucking penny in 15 years to go and get the tape to bring the tape and I was the one that was undrawn and quartered um, he said to me you're accusing me of dishonest selection so I said uh, well no I'm not I don't know how you worked that one out I said, what? I'm not accusing you of dishonest selection. I said, that's a nonsense. I said, what I'm accusing people of are dishonest, dishonest performances. Mm. I said, I don't know what fucking game you're watching. I said, but it's a different game from the one I'm playing in. Anyway, um, he gave me a free transfer after the transfer deadline, oh, uh, wow. which was the third week in March. Yeah. Yeah, he's been the third uh, so Thursday in March, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. So then I'm... Um, I'm basically unemployed, struggling. I could have gone to Dagenham and Redbridge under John Steele. Um, thought I'd done a deal, but we couldn't come to the... He offered me a massive signing-on fee and then a negligible weekly wage. I said, well, my wife just had a, a second baby. I said, I'd rather take a cut in the signing-on fee and have a bigger, a bigger basic. basic. yeah. So I don't know what the agenda was. He couldn't do it. So I ended up... Um, I was out of work. And then I somehow managed to uh, get a little bit of work um, back at Lake Orient Centre of Excellence. Yeah. Um, 
which I rechristened the uh, Centre of Mediocrity. Um, and then basically I went back there and made inroads and went back to the club in uh, 93. Mm-hmm. Their youth team had two years under ex-West Ham player Jeff Pike, who basically looked... Um, there was um, big problems, I was told, off the field with discipline. Mm. Um, and he he, it was, he couldn't handle certain things, certain aspects of it. Anyway, there was an opening and I was on uh, the interview, got on the interview process and it went through three or four stages and I actually ended up on the shortlist with another ex late Orient player and Chris Uton. Oh, wow. And uh, I got, yeah, I got the job. <laughs> so, Over Chrissy. <laughs> Yeah, well, why would you be surprised? No, no, no. It's um, just brilliant. It's just because like yeah. their names that you know people no, just, are aware of. Chris, you know, so listen, all Chris has proved, all Chris has proved is there's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah, you understand. He, uh, I, I went on the, I was in the inaugural group with Chris when we went to the Lillishaw to convert to the UEFA A from our full coaching license. And I remember we had a break one evening from the lecture theatres, and me and Chris went to the pictures and saw Donny Brasco. <laughs> and he's a good lad and I got on with him well but he's very very uh, uh, humble very quiet very unassuming mm. um, and it, and he's proved after someone at Lenore said well I don't know whether he quite had the personality and enough about him to be able to handle youths of between 16 and 18 years of age mm. but now Chris has gone away and he got rescued by Ozzy at Spurs and mm-hmm. got a nice little job at Spurs and then he's gone from strength to strength to strength yeah to strength. he's moved on yeah and uh, had unbelievable work, uh, done unbelievable work, mm-hmm. done unbelievable work. But Chris's personality was such that the point I'm making is it proves that you can go about things in different ways and still reach the same goal. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. So I went, I went back there in the in the summer of '93. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, his wife going to get that? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I don't know. We've got a delivery of some sort. No, my kids will tell you what. <laughs> they're keeping Amazon in business. My kids don't stop, you know what I mean? That, 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 that's what they won't show me how to use a computer. Because <laughs> you'll be on Amazon all day. <laughs> no, not me, but I'll just probably click and cancel the order. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, every day, every day. Even I'm still taking orders from my daughter. My second daughter moved out about three two, two months ago. And we're still <laughs> we're still getting stuff here. Have a word, mate. Have a word, yeah. John. Um, right. Yeah. So um, any, look, when, when I the, only had ten months. Ten months. Ten months as youth coach. That's all I had. Before before and becoming co co manager. Yeah, 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 yeah. The directors and the chairman went help, <laughs> help. Um, ninety three, ninety four. All the divisions were being restructured because the Premier League was, uh, yeah, well, I suppose the same, being restructured. Basically, they were trimming two teams off of the, off of the Premier League from 22 down to 20. That's right. So it had a knock-on effect with regards to the relegations. Well, our division, um, instead of three going down, four were going to go down. Mm. So with five games to go, Eustace, who... Um, had a good career at Sheffield Wednesday as a player, came down to London, couldn't handle it at West Ham under Ron Greenwood. Um, always spoke about his, his own environment, which was Stocksbridge. Mm. And he played for a team initially called Stockbridge, Stocksbridge Steels. Yeah. And self-explanatory. And then he used to talk about hard work and Northern grit. And uh, southern softies, and you've got a soft underbelly, and you've got nothing about you, and you've got no character, and you've got no backbone, and you've got no passion, and you're all shit in bed. These are the type <laughs> of things he used to say. These are the type of things he used to say. Uh, what does he do? He gives up. He plays it cute and becomes the victim. Right. Right. He, he says to the bald, <clears throat> uh, this is more or less verbatim. Uh, well, look, gentlemen. Um, I've had enough of listening to this. Um, have you got uh, Have you got uh, enough faith in me to finish the job? Uh, yes or no? And then a couple of the board members piped up and said, "Quite frankly, Peter, the answer is no." Mm. So he stood up, pushed his chair back, shuffled his papers, um, and said, "In that case, the next time you hear from me will be through my solicitor and the League Managers Association." Oh, bloody hell! Uh, good day. And and the board meeting was the first Thursday. 
the first Thursday in every month. Mm. And he said, uh, and then he walked out the door, got his papers, walked, got his folder, walked out the door. Um, so he went from, you know, grit and determination and passion and uh, work ethic, northern work ethic and blah, 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 to playing the victim and walking out and giving up. Um, and that's, that's when I got the call with five games to go. Yeah. Um, Maybe they, they, you survived that season, did you not? Yeah. You, you kept them up. Um, but um, we but, Listen, I delayed the inevitable. Yeah. With hindsight, experience, switched on. Uh, right, okay, let's not beat about the bush. I'm not coming across as lovey-dovey, huggy-kissy and, uh, you know, like acting the idiot, but really and truly as sharp as a carpet tack like Harry um, and everybody's favourite uncle and best mate. You go in there forensically, where do you want to be? How do you want to do it? Um, do you want me to manage short, medium and long term? Do you want me to plan? Da, da, da. There's two ways of su- success in football. Uh, baby steps, slowly but surely, land the correct foundations, building a core element to the club with a certain culture, or basically uh, take a chance on me being able to handle the personalities and just throw millions and millions and millions of pounds at it in the hope that you're going to get success and get promoted and or win a cup, depending on what division you're in. If you're Premier League, you're looking you know, with some of the hundreds of millions that have been spent at places like West Ham, you've got to, you've got to at least the bare, the bare minimum you've got to look for is respectable, um, uh, respectably competing for a Europa League place and winning one of the cups mm. um, instead of which they're, you know, they're wanting the season called off because they might get relegated. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so I could go in there and, and, and that's, that's, that's basically with the benefit of hindsight, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have took the job with, with the experience I've got now. Um, you know, and two, like all I did in relation to what you said is all I did was I delayed the inevitable mm. to well, the detriment of my own career. One, one of your famous quotes um, and, uh, <laughs> is bring your dinner. And um, yeah. that, that's how I discovered yeah. you, to be honest. I, I didn't really know much, much about you when I was in my early 20s and things like that. Um, and that was, um, yeah. um, that was sort of, uh, uh, well, it was a half-time debrief, if you want to call it that. And um, you, weren't, you didn't seem particularly happy with, with Terry Howard, who appeared to be a good friend of yours. Um, did you two ever patch it up after that? No, I spoke to him. I spoke to him since uh, um, I think he ended up signing for Wickham afterwards. No, I spoke to him since. I ain't seen him. Um, although I was told he was at a game and um, his sister was at a game with him and she wanted to bash me up or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, she's. Yeah. I remember I used to I used to get on well with his family. I knew um, you know, I was introduced to his mum and dad. I got on well with them. I was introduced to his sister. I got on well with her, and I got introduced to his uh, his sister's husband. I always got on well with all of them. Mm. Yeah, I always got on well with them. Got on well with Terry. Everybody loved Terry. You know what I mean? But it's like someone had a thing the other day. He played over three hundred games for Late Orient. You knobhead, because someone said that they saw as a Late Orient supporter possibly um, what I saw, Mm. which you know, uh, different people have different standards, and people have uh, different opinions on what the prerequisites for a footballer should be. Yeah. Um, and although Terry was a teammate and everybody loved him and everybody got on because he was very, you know, he was inoffensive and easygoing and he had very laid back, sort of comfortable um, manner about him and a humorous uh, disposition. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody liked him, you know what I mean? But when it comes down to, uh, you know, forensically looking at what's being contributed, plus the contractual situation that he put himself in, mm-hmm. plus the fact that I tried to help him, plus the fact that he put on... I've got it in my briefcase out there, so I'm working from memory. It's one or the other. He either put on £8 in 11 days or £11 in eight days. Yeah. Because he used to wait up Monday and Friday, um, you know, just to give it an air of professionalism about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, before, you know, before and after. Um, you know, before the weekend, ready for the game, then after... Then after the weekend, what kind of weekend you had? You know what I mean? Yeah, when you of course. On a Monday. Yeah. Um, and he, he just, he was literally got to the stage where he was taking the piss. Mm-hmm. So I basically, in a nutshell, let me tell you, the whole thing can be summed up in synopsis by, 
by uh, my own take on it, which is I had like massive, massive, massive responsibility with no power. Mm. Right. Uh, but as a manager, you, you, you've got to have both. Yeah. You need both. You must have both. Um, and then what I, I tried to get Terry to sign a two year deal on the same money to take him up to his testimonial. Yeah. And he said, no, he said, and he wanted a 30% rise on his basic, which I thought was too much anyway, compared to what I earned. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you, you know, is that, is that sits, is that how his mind works? Is he that vindictive? Is he looking at the Cunninghams and the Silkmans and the, uh, and the Howards and, uh, and that, and the Ketridges and all that, who were not particularly good players. A couple of them, like I'm talking borderline shit, wouldn't have got in my Sunday side. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, three, three times, four times as much money I was. Right. Is he look? Is he that vindictive? Well, no, I'm not. What I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be sensible, and I'm trying to give you, as 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 well as uh, a sense of realization, um, with regards to your own contractual situation, the situation that's going on at the club, without betraying uh, professional etiquette. Mm. So I said, you're not going to get that tell, right? I said, but if you listen to me, it will take you up to your testimony. Nah, nah, fuck that. He says, da da da. He wanted a rise from seven hundred to a thousand pound a week. He mm. wanted a hundred pound appearance money. And he wanted, um, and this is how like uh, it's like branded. Yeah, it's like I'm I'm one of the cattle in the Wild West. It's branded on me on me on me brain. Um, he wanted a, a testimonial fund kicked off by the by the directors. He said if they all put two grand each, that will give me a ten grand kickstart and blah blah. I said like, tell no, all due respect. I said like, you're carrying on like with these demands, like you're fucking Mick Jagger or someone. You, know what I mean? <laughs> you ain't that. Tell. I said they can't. They can't even afford to have a whip round and buy a box of tea bags. We yeah. can't even. They can't even settle the milk bill between five of them. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so yeah. they said, "All right, then I'll sign a weekly contract." Then he got shredded at home to Blackpool. One of the biggest chases I've ever seen of any footballer in any game in any division mm. in any country. And I just said, "You know what? Fuck this. I've had it. I've had it up to here. I'm him trying off. to protect him against himself, save him from himself." Let him sign a seven-day contract when I've offered him a two-year deal to take him up to his testimonial. Then I've got to put up with directors who ain't got a clue what they're looking at. Mm. And they're actually saying, well, can't, can't, he's got to be worth 300 grand. Can't, can't we get 300 grand? Like people like Derek Weinray, who died last year. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the most mischievous, um, behind-your-back talking rumour mongers ever on the planet. And uh, never contributed a bar of soap or a bottle of Ozine to the club. Uh, in all in all the time I knew him, um, and yet he was like a director and fucking vice chairman. You think, well, how do people get this power without putting in the pot? Yeah, you know of course. I mean? And I and I said three hundred grand. I said, who's going to pay three hundred grand for Terry Howard? I said, don't make me. Alan Kirbishly rung up from Chowan, and he said, what sort of money would you want for Terry? I said, well, I've been told to ask for three hundred grand now, and we both started laughing. Down the phone. <laughs> oh, and he God. Just said, he just, he just said, uh, nah, he said, nah, nah, yeah, you're nah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that was that. That's, that, that's, that was our, that was how that transpired. And, um, and that's how we sort of fell out. Mm. Yeah. That's how we fell out. I didn't want to fall. I don't like falling out with people. Yeah. So, so um, no, there was, there was a, there's a friendship between, um, between you guys. And obviously you played with each other as well. And, you know, I was, I've always wanted to know, um, how that went down? Um, yeah, about- no, it was, good. it was a good teammate. Funny, funny teammate. Yeah, we were different walks of life. He was he used to go with the clubbers because he was when he when he come. Um, he, he, the thing we got in common, we made uh, we made it into Chelsea's worst ever eleven. Oh, he was an he was another one at the, at the wrong time. Um, he was probably put because of his physique. He was put in. He was put in before his time. He was thrown under the bus. Maybe similar to me. And yeah. then there's like a, a, a famous photo of Gary Burtles getting across him and scoring at near post. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, we had that we had that in, in common because, you know, you've got not very, uh, you've got brain dead, not very sympathetic Chelsea supporters. Like, you know, we we fucking do And then they start booing you away. Mm. They expect me, a 19-year-old kid who's just got in the side to turn around the fortunes. From yeah, of course. Yeah, it's not gonna happen, when you've it? got like lying, cheating, drinking, uh, people hiding, um, who haven't put a shift in for like a season and a half, mm. managing to stay out of thing and living off the back of a promotion from two and a half years ago. So I look back and I just think, you know what? Yeah, all right, okay, 
um, it happened. It, it, you, you kind of thinking like, you know, what the fuck do you know? I know what I know. And and looking at it now, I, I saw, I read a fantastic article the other weekend and it's, um, it was on Joey Barton and they asked Joey Barton, the manager, would he have signed Joey Barton, the player? Right? Yeah. And, um, well, so the point I'm making is you look back at yourself, you look back at circumstances, you look back at the goings-on, you look back at the personalities involved, and you think, you know what, if I'd have been as forensic then as I am now, I'd have just gone, especially some of the stick I took, and mm. some of the, what would be now bullying, really, from, from uh, you know, so-called teammates and squad members, you know, I'd have just gone bump, 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 and I'd have fucking cut them down. I'd have cut them down like you wouldn't believe. Mm. because the club was full of people who hid. It was full of cheats. It was full of pissheads. It was full of fucking gamblers. Mm. It was full of people who took the piss out of the supporters and took the piss out of the club, but managed somehow to keep it a secret. Yeah. And stay, keep the rest below the parapet. And there then you've got like more on Chelsea supporters thinking, who is this fucking 18, 19 year old at centre back who's been bought in the side on merit, on mm. merit, right? And having earned it, but absolutely they're mystified, like why it is I can't turn the whole thing around. Yeah. So when I, every little mistake I made got highlighted and I was playing against recognised full internationals in every game. Yeah. Right? But every little mistake I made got highlighted with boos and fucking whistles and cat calls and walk whistles when everybody else had caused it. And uh, yeah, basically that's how it was. But I, I had that, listen, I had that in common with Terry. Do you know what I mean? Because we come through a tough. We come through a tough route. We come a, a very tough road down a tough road, and um, truth be told, <clears throat> I tried to protect Terry from himself. I tried to help Terry. I tried to make sure Terry got his testimonial. But um, like Leighton Orient, he had delusions of grandeur. He was an absolute perfect microcosm at a club. Yeah, he had delusions of grandeur, and he thought he was worth X amount, and he thought he was. It was a certain level of player when I can assure you, as sure as God made little green apples and may I die of heart attack at seven o'clock tonight, it was fucking nowhere near the level he thought he was or Frank yeah. Clark thought he was or Brian Eastick thought he was, mm. right? But that's the difference between me now and me then. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm at a stage where now in my life, I really don't give two fucks about what people think <laughs> uh, with regards to my opinion because I know that I've worked it through forensically and I'm right. Yeah, you could stick anything I found under a microscope, and I'm bang on the money. You, you yeah, that's where we that's where we was at, me until yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, Matt, I spoke. Sorry, oh, that's all right. Cool. Uh, like, you, you sort of alluded um, to it briefly earlier, and it's actually a question that um, that was that was passed over as well um, about the mental side of today's players. You know, how would how would you the John sitting now handle the mental side of players? to get the best out of them in today's game? Well, you know what I said earlier? You do, <clears throat> they talk about man management. Yeah. I don't believe in man, in man management because men manage themselves. I think what I'd have a little bit more awareness of now is the fact that um, I can't get away with could because it's a little bit of an arrogant assumption. It wasn't an arrogant assumption in the first place. Although I'm still leaning that way, you know what I mean? Um, whereby you can't treat everybody the same mm. and you can't you can't have one set of rules for everybody and blah, blah, blah. But I did say in my book as a proviso um, that I recognised that and I maybe could have forgiven some, sh some shortcomings if we'd have had a Peter Osgood or a George Best in the team. Mm. You know what I mean? But I can't. I can't forgive shortcomings when there's a collective, um, and I'm talking to someone who, uh, you know, uh, who was at best um, a decent lower division centre back. You understand mm -hmm. what I mean? So I was no like fucking England international with 80 caps or whatever. Although it's the same game, and although I could probably coach um, all the pundits on the telly off the football field, and most of the pundits uh, around England off the football field, I, I could fucking blow them away, um, or at least be as good. Um, and then you say, well, well, if you was if you was asked, you know, in a, in a survey, uh, hundred people were asked who's the England international and who's the who's the majority, who's the third division centre back, um, you might pick the wrong one because of how well I've coached, right? Mm. Well, the bottom line is, um, I would say I would have to adjust, I would have to have, have adjusted myself a little bit. 
You understand what I mean? In mm-hmm. the respect that, but I'm going to be honest with you, I don't, <laughs> I don't subscribe to like, and I've met him, uh, Mourinho. I don't subscribe to like Mourinho sending texts. I don't need you. You're my manager. I don't need you. To, if you, if I'm training well and you're picking me, and you might have even given me the armband, that's yeah. good enough. Right? You've seen in me, right, that we get on and uh, we've got a good relationship and it's professional. When we've had our rows at half time and whatever, I like Clark, say, eh, right? Mm. Uh, but, you know, by and, large, by and large, I'm a trustworthy, honourable, solid man um, and loyal, right? Yeah. Then you don't have to keep sending me texts. You don't have to say, keep saying, oh, you were magnificent, da da da. And it's all right, you can go and have a game of golf on Monday. Uh, yeah, I know you've got size nine feet, but I've seen you out the shower. You're a very well put together man. What a magnificent uh, endowment you've got. Like, all this bollocks, I can't have it. I yeah, can't yeah, have yeah. it. You understand? All this like massaging people's egos and fucking t- taking the time out and blah, blah, blah. Leave them, leave them to lead their life as long as it's a clean life. Um, and leave them to be men and make their own way. But always offer a like I used to, right? And that's one thing I've always been good at is I've cared about the people that have played under me and I've tried to offer them little words of guidance, little, little, and a couple of players have recognised it as they've become really full-grown men and had their own children, right? Mm -hmm. And they've said publicly that things I've said to them, they still use to this day. And they still use it in not only their personal and private life, but also in their working and business life. Mm -hmm. So, So that gives me satisfaction. But what I will hold my hands up with and will say is maybe I would make one or two adjustment, uh, adjustments, right? But by and large, I've got the same opinion in the respect that um, coaching is management. Yeah. Not man- managers, managers and management is not management. Coaching is management. Yeah. I don't even know if that makes sounds like it makes sense. But I'm hoping you'll latch on to it because let me tell you this, this to my mother. Uh, sorry, uh, I beg your pardon. This is what I said this, when I was having the thing. I stood up. My missus said, well, all right, no one's here. Just me. And I said, yeah, but I can't get me nut around it. It's getting me nut. I said, let me tell you one thing with regards to what Wilkie and Purse said on their interview. It was a late morning podcast anyway. Da, da, da. And the dream team would be Frank Clark's manager sitting as coach, right? And I'll keep maintaining coaching his management. Here, he, here it is in a nutshell. A football club can do easily do without a manager but a football club cannot do without a coach that's, that's so to me right, that sums yeah. it up my, my my opinion you understand no that, that, a, a that, that, team that and a football club can do without a manager but they can't do without a coach mm. right so um yeah the, the only <laughs> the only thing is like, it, it's slightly contradictory to what Dario Grady once said to me he said you, he said, you, you're building a good reputation for yourself or you're, you're building a good name for yourself. He said, I'm saying to you, if it comes to like a fork in the road where you choose, do you choose like uh, yourself as a wannabe manager or a wannabe coach? He said, always pick coaching. He said, because as a coach, you'll never be out of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> apart from apart from free non-lead jobs, um, I have been, which is why I became a black cab driver. Yeah. But um yeah, if I if I in in a sentence, I'd say yeah. Certain aspects, in answer to your question, there's certain aspects about myself um, I'd look to change. Mm. Yeah, but I am what I am. You know what I mean? Um, I, and uh, the best way I can find to explain the whole thing is, I wouldn't be embarrassed to face anybody mm. that was there then. But I know for sure there's been one or two individuals who have been embarrassed to face me. Yeah, you know what I mean. You know, I, I had to listen to bollocks that someone uh, put on YouTube and they guided. It was an interview, very appropriate and very apt. Um, uh, Glenn Cockrell, who was a midfield player. Yeah. Now, it's funny, you see. You can make mistakes because my perception of Glenn was he was on my side. Mm-hmm. And I thought we had a good relationship and I thought we got on. And he, he actually said on the interview, he said, yeah, John, he said, uh, he was a good coach. He said, but I think, like, you know, it should have been left to Chris to be the manager. So the ideal thing would have been Chris's manager um, and, and, and John as coach. Oh, you just broke, you broke up again there. Sorry, John. Um, you said about, um, you said about um, Chris being manager. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. It was Glenn Cockrell. He, his opinion was he thought that Chris should have been manager and I should have been, I should have been uh, the coach because he said that uh, um, he actually had, he had to admit that I could coach and I was a decent coach. Mm. Um, and he's sitting in a bar with his um, long time chum uh, from I'm assuming from their Southampton days, Mickey Adams. Yeah. Um, who I knew as a kid at Gillingham uh, with a very with a very uh, high opinion of himself. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I thought it was very appropriate that they were doing the interview from now. Uh, but maybe that's where I went wrong. You know what I mean? Mm. Instead of leaving the missus and kids to fend for themselves and going to, going, spending all night in a bar to, to build uh, a social network, I was a family man. You know what I yeah. mean? But um, I always maintain that. I think a club can get by without a manager, but he can't get by without a coach. But it's just funny how you think that people are on your side and your perception. And like in this case, uh, Glenn Cockrell, um, his take on you. And he starts saying, I didn't trust people. Mm. Honestly and truly, uh, you know, maybe I didn't articulate it well enough, but nobody was more trustworthy than me. And he'd, he'd say, I keep going over stuff. Well, forgive me, but that's my fucking job. Yeah. That's my job. My job is to keep giving... And Malcolm Allison always used to say, great coaches are great naggers, right? Well, that's my job. That's my job, not only to light the fire and to sow seeds and to show you the way and to show you many wide and varied aspects of the game and help you grow as a player and, and be a good player within a unit and a great unit within a, within a, within a, a side um, and, and build the culture of humility to be able to be coached and, but it's also my job to give you gentle nudges and reminders little because we're all human beings. And at the end of the day, um, I need to stay on top of things. I need to stay on top of you. And I need you to know that I'm watching your every move. Mm. Otherwise, what kind of coach am I? You understand? I get that. I'm just like some of them now. I'm like some of them now who ain't got a fucking clue what they're looking at, but they're somehow bluffing their way through, through sycophancy. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't have to have a shit shave or haircut. Right. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and basically, they'd go, oh, yeah, that'd do. I've told him that'd do. You know what I mean? No, you've got to keep, you've got to keep on and on. And like Big Mel said, great coaches are great naggers. And you've got to keep on and Build your confidence. I'm a great believer in deconstructivism, right, in terms of football. And I'll strip it back and I'll take you back to basics. And then once you're comfortable with the basics, you grow from there. You understand? Yeah. But unless I keep on and on and on, I don't get a player like Cockrell with his much experience. I don't get him saying that I didn't trust people and that he kept on and I, da, 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 da. And he was maybe, a, uh, he's all right as a coach, but maybe Chris Turner was the man manager. I don't, you understand? I don't get that. But anyway, we agree to disagree. What, what it ties in with, it ties in with saying always heard. When a team's successful, when a team's successful, um, when a club's successful, the common denominator is, and always has been, I've heard it from different people. I've experienced it myself in the promotion winning season of 88, 89. It feels good. Mm. This is what Peter said. It feels, as you go along the, along the, you go on the voyage of that season, it feels good. Or the other saying, it felt right. Yeah. Or the other saying, Every, everything was in place and it just felt right. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when you've got an environment like that, you've got a chance. Of, uh, that's the common denominator that run that runs through everything. When I've picked up little snippets from people, oh, you know, da, 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 what was it like? What was the spirit? Did? And they all said they all said more or less the same thing. The same thing, right? You're paraphrasing one or two words, but other than that, at that I'm tell, I can assure you, it's more or less verbatim, right? We had the complete opposite. We had off the field troubles. We had people who hadn't been uh, players who hadn't been paid money. Mm. We had players who refused to sign contracts. We had players who we had to let go. We had staff who we had to let go. The club was uh, uh, club was hemorrhaging money, and then in the end, you had an absentee board who literally took the piss. So I ended up doing I ended up doing six jobs, um, all of which now, with the benefit hindsight of it and experience. I'd have got a copy of a newspaper, sat back, put my feet on the desk like Frank Clark used to do. <laughs> Before training every day, he used to read a copy of every newspaper, the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, the Sun, the Mirror, 
and uh, one of the broadsheets. And you go, if you knocked on the door and opened the door, if you're sitting there with his feet on the desk reading the paper, that's what I should have done. I'm not going to try and <clears throat> raise money by cutting costs. I'm not going to try and raise money commercially so we get an overnight stay for Stockport County. I'm not going to raise money through an unbelievable run where we got 150 grand from two cup games against Birmingham in the auto windscreen final, area final. Mm. I'm just going to relax and let it all happen, let it all unfold. Go, when people head. ask me, <laughs> let it go over my head or give them, the, give them the, an answer that ties in with me being the victim. Mm. Yeah, that's what should have done. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, um, you've got, uh, you said you've got another book coming out. When's, when's the book due? What's it called? Yeah, well, what, what we're doing, uh, I'm still selling like loads of copies of the first book, The Little Knowledge is a Dangerous Thing. Mm. Uh, and that, that came out a couple of years ago now. Um, the copyright's actually uh, two fa- the last part of 2016. Anyway, we managed to overcome like more fences than the Grand National to be able to get that book on the market, <laughs> um, including someone who was, who was meant to help me write it. Um, I actually did that cover to cover within eight months four pads of A4 and a pen, mm. um, one o'clock in the morning after finishing the shift in the cab, um, and then I've got someone to type it out for me. And then latter-day people have been saying, what about a volume two? So I said, yeah, what about a volume two? So then the feedback's been so immense, immensely mm. uh, uh, supportive and, and, and positive. <laughs> I've got with little more knowledge, Naked Proof, and The Legend of Nifnuff. <laughs> so that's going to be volume two. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, right. we look, we look so, forward to that. As soon as yeah, that comes out, yeah, can you get us a message and um, we'll make sure we tweet that out and we'll put that out there as well. So, um, and, uh, oh, yeah, no, that'd, yeah. Be, that'd be lovely if you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. And, um, yeah, if anyone um, wants to see what John gets up to, because he, he's brilliant on Twitter, I've got to say, um, The Real Sits, um, at The Real Sits, you'll be able to find him on that's Twitter. It, yeah. Um, yeah. John, Thank you so I much. Listen, I'm, I'm, that's all right, mate. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of not answering questions. I just go on a ramble. <laughs> I have verbal diarrhea and I still haven't answered, I still haven't answered the last question. Basically, um, we're looking to get it out um, at the end of this summer. So we run up to Christmas. Yeah. Uh, that'll be volume two. Brilliant. Uh, but in the meantime, if people haven't got volume one, um, all they've got to do is contact me on Twitter or they go to my uh, email address, which is uh, Louisa sitting at tiscarly.co.uk happy days I'll, uh, I'll put that on our Twitter page as well I'll put it on our Facebook page so everyone will be able to see it and um, when um, when uh, when this goes out properly again um, I'll put all your links on the bottom of the screen so everyone will be able to see um, what they are and be able That's to very, get very contact for, a, for, a, for a, a copy of your book and I'll be getting a copy myself as well um, this has been a uh, show for t- Top. Once again, it's myself, Gav Mack, and we've had uh, John sitting on the show today. Um, make sure you tune in for our show later on in the week, um, which is the five midfield, which will be on at seven o'clock on Thursday night. But for me and John, thank you and good night. <laughs>